Wisdom where we go over tips, tricks, and information on band instrument repair. Today is the fourth day of Padtober. Uh, make sure you take that hashtag, put that in the comments below. We are going to feature woodwind pads in all of the streams this month of October. We're going to do flute, clarinet. Uh, we might even get into an oboe pad install as well as a saxophone pad in the towards the end of the month or maybe the first of November. Uh, we do have a winner from last week, and the winners are going to have chance for two prizes so we've got our courses coming up and the yes. the most uh the closest one that we're going to be doing is october 16th to the 18th that is our hand engraving course so if you are a technician out in the world and you want to take your technician vacation usually they take vacations in uh late october so come on down and you can learn the skill of hand engraving with ryan uh, ryan is prepping for that course as we speak he's getting all the tooling ready so that'll be a fun course to take we also have our sax smackdown coming up at the end of february next oh, year yeah. and we're going to put the description and stuff up on the website soon but uh if you want to get ahead of it i have two prizes so we've got a discount on the sax smackdown for today's winner that's 15 yes. percent off the entrance fee and we have 25 percent off the last minute tuition for the engraving course because we have one spot left and Ryan was like, oh, it'd be nice to get another person. Uh, so to do Ryan a solid, uh, go ahead and sign up for the engraving course and get yourself down here if you're interested in that uh, skill. And so you can win 25% off the current tuition that is on the website right now. And yes. the winner for that is, uh, this is the username, uh, Jaeger Dives. Ooh, good username very I fun it. i like it so if you are a fan of jaeger uh send an email to rich r-a-c-h and musicmedic.com and i'll get you your discount code and ryan, uh sorry i almost called you ryan uh leroy let's get right into it just we're, just shorter here <laughs> we're we're <laughs> we are going to be talking about pads today so let's go over um before we get into how to install a closed hole yes. flute pad, which is our topic of today's tutorial, let's go over the pads that we make here at musicmedic.com okay. and tell them a little bit about the flute pads that we have and what we'll be using today. All right, so here's our plethora of, all, of our traditional flute pads. I'll go from right to left here. So we have our 2.9 millimeter thickness. Um, we have it available in white bladder and yellow bladder. We also have a 2.7 which is available on our website only in yellow, but if uh, during the checkout process, um, you want the white, the white bladder on that one, you can actually just put, please use white bladder on those. There's no extra charge for that because all the dimensions and stuff are the same. It's just the color of the bladder is different. Very cool. Uh, we also have it in 2.5 in uh, stock on our site in white and yellow. These three are all woven felt. We do have one, that is press felt, which is this guy right here. And then it's a 2.5 millimeter available in yellow. Okay, very good. So that is the pads that we're going to use. Now let's go over the tools that we're going to have to install a closed hole flute pad. Okay, so it's a lot, but it's a lot of small stuff. All right. So we've got obviously the flute itself. We've got our little ES1000 blazer torch, uh, a feeler gauge assortment, my go-to pliers, which is our parallel duckbill pliers, um, big light, flute shims, our material shears, which are used for a plethora of items. Got our flute pad iron, tweezers, a couple screwdrivers, a spring hook, depending on which keys you're using, um, a regular pen and a sharpie, whether it be a regular tip or a fine tip. My other eyes, because okay. I have a hard time seeing, and a digital calendar. Okay, excellent. So that's all the tools that we're going to use. It seems like a lot, but it's you're right. It's like a lot, a of, lot little, of small little stuff. stuff. Yeah. Very good. So if somebody who's just getting into repair, it doesn't take a lot of tooling to be able to replace pads on their flute. A lot uh, of little stuff, but not a lot of expensive stuff. Yeah, you're not having to get like big dent balls or anything crazy big. I mean, you know, like all this stuff maybe. Just kind of shooting from the hip. Not including these people. <laughs> and not the torch either. But okay. like all this stuff, maybe like 20, 50 bucks. Very like, good. Depending on how much stock you would get. Okay, very good. So that is our tools. Easy to get from Music Medic or anywhere else that you need to get your woodwind stuff from. Yes. 
let's get into the first step. All right. So the first step is to basically just kind of figure out um, which pad or figure out what pad you would need to replace. I've already gone through this. So this particular pad uh, is worn out. It actually has a little tear on the back side here where you can't see. So in order to replace this pad, we're going to take this key section off first. So all, this, all i got to do is just get over there, take the rod, and loosen the rod. So you grab the end of the rod with your pliers. Very oh, cool. Yeah. I can use my fingers, but this is so much better. All right. So, so now I have the key and the pad off. So now at this point, and you can you can see it here. Unlike unlike any other normal pad like a, like clarinet or saxophone, some saxes have this, so I don't want to say that. But this has a screw with a washer that actually holds this pad on there. So so this is the only thing that actually holds this pad in place. There okay. is no glue on here. All right. So here I will pull this forward. I will. Unscrew that little screw and washer, take it off. The important part from here, is to put the is to put this little screw and washer this tiny somewhere where you can easily access it. So like a screw board or something like this where you have like a nice surface that's clean, but you can easily see the washer and so it doesn't get lost. All right. Just make sure that it doesn't get lost or knocked off the table because ah, finding it... Pain in the butt. Pain in the butt. Okay. Not so easy. So from here, all I'm going to do is take this pad out so you can either use a screwdriver or a pad prick or something like that just to remove the, just to remove the pad. So not a big deal. Um, from here, this actually has a couple... I will show this part. So this actually has a couple different things going on. So this... So this is a this is a shim, and this is actually a full shim that was actually in this pad cup. And there's actually another shim on the back of the pad. Mm. So what um, the the best and easiest way to figure out what thickness or size pad you need when you're replacing is to actually measure the thickness of the pad that you took that you took out, and then measure the pad cup for the diameter. Mm. Okay. And then from that for that digital caliper, you can use a non-digital one. This is just easier. It saves you some time, and it just it straight up tells you, you need this. Okay, very yeah. good. Well, I mean, if it had a voice, that'd be cool. It doesn't, but you know, if it did, it'd be cool. So from here, again, that shim, that shim on the back is kind of stuck to it, which is fine. So I'm just going to go ahead and measure the thickness of that. We're at 2.86, 2.85, mm. which is totally fine. And that's just that one shim and the pad. So if we go back to the, the pad sizes that we that we offer, and then this is these are normal. Those are normal thicknesses. Thicknesses, yeah. Gotcha. I, mean, you, I mean, from almost any from any vendor anywhere. Okay. Um, so two point eight. The clo I mean, it's kind of like right in between these two, right? Yes. So because this shin was in that pad cup, I would probably err on the thick side. So I would go the two nine. Okay. And. But also leave that shim in there. Okay. Just to make double sure. Because, oh, really? Yeah, because from experience, I've noticed that there's been a, there's been a tendency that sometimes just the whole measurement of this and that. And two nine is again, these two are super close to this. Okay. So it could be just like a little variance on that one side of the pad, or who knows. Okay. Um, so I usually like to err on the side of a little bit thick, especially if there's a whole shim in there. All right. If there is not, I'll err on the side of thinner. Now, Leroy, just before you keep going, what about if they got a flute and there's no pad in the pad cup and they have they don't have an old pad to reference? Uh, How do they determine the thickness that they should put in there? That's a very good question. Um, the, one of the easiest ways to do it, hopefully there's other pads in there, would be to just remove another part of the key section or a different key section, take that pad out, and then do the same thing. Okay. However, if there are no pads in there, um, that's a that's a tougher one. I mean, the only thing that I would suggest at that point would be to measure the depth of the pad cup itself, mm -hmm. and then have 
And again, different brands have different pad protrusions. Um, from my experience, if it's, a, if it's a student flute, nine times out of 10, you're gonna wanna use the 2.9. Mm, okay. Um, you could you could play it safe and do the two seven and get some shims. And if it's too thin, you could put a couple shims behind it to take up that extra space. Okay. All right. So, so that's yeah, cool. that's a great question because that cause that that can definitely happen. So we've got our pad out of the pad cup. Yes. So from here, I've already I've already measured and got the correct diameter and thickness of pad. And if you look really carefully, there's a little mark on there. And I've already put this in there and done this, but I'll show you why here in a second and where that lines up. You can actually look at the shim and kind of guess. So you can actually see that I've marked the inside of the shim with, the, with a pen to line up with the pad arm. I do the same thing for the pad. I'm going to make sure that that pad goes in there just like that so that mark lines up with the pad arm. And there might be some people, why the heck are you marking your pads? Mm -hmm. You're going to see it? Well, first of all, no, you're not going to see it. Because that, because that washer is going to cover it up. You just have to make sure that the mark you make is small enough that you won't see it when it is put together. So, put the screw on there. Can't see the mark. All looks good. It's like nothing ever happened, right? So from here, um, it doesn't matter how tight or taut the skin is on that flu pad when you get it out of the bag or whatever when it's brand new. When you put that washer on there, just because of the way everything works, um, there will be some wrinkles in there. Okay. And to make sure that you get a good, true idea of how the pad's going to go onto the tone hole, you're going to want to iron that out. So, so this, so our flute pad iron. There we go. You can actually see the W. Hmm. Very cool. Or music medic, but Carolina's backwards. So we're going to go this way. <laughs> um, so this is our flute pad iron. This is a very cool design because uh, it is two different sizes on each side. So this side here is actually a smaller diameter, and this is really, really good for those, um, for the Asian flutes that have the smaller pads for like on the thumb and on the G sharp. Very nice. Uh, this side right here, you can pretty much use for pretty much everything else. Okay. And um, it's, the other thing I like about this is, it's big enough where it doesn't interfere with the washer. You don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to worry about doing anything funky. It gives you maximum pad area where you want to put on the pad iron. Okay. So from here, we will bring this little guy over. As much as people might want that to be vodka, it's not. It's just water. Sorry, okay. guys. Sorry to disappoint. Uh, so I'll take my pad iron. I'll just dunk it in there. Knock the extra water off. Put a little bit of water on the pad. And then either on a shirt or your arm or whatever, wipe off the excess water. And from here, I'll grab the torch. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm basically going to heat this up. And I'm just going to heat it up just enough where it's not hot, but a little hotter than warm. Okay. And a good way to test that is as you're heating it, either use the inside of your arm, because the inside of your arm is going to be a little t more tender than like the top side of your hand or anywhere else. All right. So I will, I'll just heat this up, do a couple passes, check it. That's perfect. And just do the thing. And all the wrinkles that were on that pad are now gone. So Leroy, what happens if you do, so it looks like you're hitting it for about a second with the torch. And if yeah. it's, what happens if it kind of hurts when you put it up against your arm? If it, if it hurts your arm, it's gonna, it's gonna hurt that pad. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's the only way I can say it, because because uh, if it gets too hot, you can actually burn through the skin, hmm. and then okay. you're at square one again. You have to take it off and put a new pad in there again. Okay. Uh, so the only thing that you're trying to do at this point is to kind of just take the wrinkles out of the skin, like ironing clothes. Not too many people do it anymore, unfortunately, but that's the idea. Okay. Um, and the reason why I like to use water on doing this is if for some reason your iron is a little bit hotter than it could be or should be, that water will give you a nice little protective barrier on there. Plus it plus it also aids in the ironing of the skin. Too. Sure. Okay. So we've got the pad installed. It hasn't yep. been leveled and it, the skin has been ironed. Yep. So everything is prepped, ready to go. Okay. So now I will put this back on here. And 
And just as a as a heads up, everybody, doing doing flu pad work, it can it does take some time, but it is very rewarding when it's done. Okay. So I haven't checked this or anything, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn the leak light on, put the light in there, and I'm gonna just get this up. Okay, cool. So I use the 2.9, but I also put the shim in there. So it's hard to see because everything's like everything's shiny. But on the on the front side of this pad right here, it's light. It's, All right. It's hitting the back first. So that'll so that's going to tell me that the shim that's in there, the pole shim that I put in there, we can take it out. Everything will be good to go. Okay. Um, while we're doing that. I'm going to show you guys how to do a partial shim. So if there's so if there's an area where say it's hitting say the pad's hitting everywhere really good except one little small area. Mm. And we'll do we'll do a little bit of a little bit of make believe right now. Say say it's hitting perfectly 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 but like there's a little a little wedge right here in the front. So I used my Sharpie. I marked it where the area would be that it's not catching. And the way to check that is you take your feeler gauge, hold this down, and you basically just go all the way around the pad, find where it's not catching, and then basically mark where it's not catching. Now, Leroy, I have a kind of silly question. You just use a marker on a, yes. on a flute. But and a sharpie permanent marker to boot, right? Yeah. What what's going on with that? How how do they get how do they get that off? You don't. I'm just kidding. No, no, no. <laughs> Probably thinking, what the heck is this dude doing? No, um, because it's metal and it's. Uh, I mean, even this one. This is nickel plated. Mm -hmm. Even on silver, it doesn't matter. It it does come off. Okay. I mean, this is nickel. It actually comes off easier than silver. So I I mean I've literally licked my thumb and rubbed it off. Okay. Um, the other thing, the other thing to use that is perfectly acceptable, I've never had a problem with it, is to get some denatured alcohol on a paper towel and just wipe it off, and no one ever knows what happened. Okay, very good. Unless you tell them, and you know, there's no reason to do that. So, so again, we'll take the key off. Pliers here. Take the keys off again. We'll smooth that stuff out of the way. So now, so what we saw would be it was hitting very back heavy. So I would probably, and if I was doing the normal repair and not a tutorial here, I would probably take this pad out just like this, and I would remove and I would remove that shim that's in there. Okay, and then put it back together, and it would probably be either perfect or really close to in the ballpark where I want to be. Okay. But for showing you guys how to do um, like a partial shim where it's like we talked about where if it's just that one little area in the front would be light, this is how you would do that. So I'll kind of cut this out already. Um, these, the shim material, I will move this out of the way for a second. This is only three of our um, thicknesses. We do have about, I think we have a total of five. Mm -hmm. um, but these are the most common, especially when you're doing partial shimming. I would never use anything more than a three thousandths when doing partial shimming without actually stacking it. Um, so we, we have the one thousandths, we have the one, two, and three thousandths. Color coded, so it's easy to know which one's which. Okay. So what I'm going to do is hold, with, with my cool little tweezers here, I'm going to hold the shim. I'm going to get my... Get my little cutting shears here, and then I'm going to do a little cut. So you're actually holding the piece that you want to keep in the tweezers. Yes. Interesting. This will this will save you a lot of heartache and headache and swear words and you know insert insert frustration there because if it falls on your bench, you're gonna to have to go. Okay, now I got to pick it up. And yes. Then, and usually it's small like this, or okay. if not small. So from here. The mark that you made, basically, you're, you mark where it stopped or where it started to catch and stop and stopped catching on the pad cup, and then same thing over here. So basically, this area that's, I'll say, the void is where you want to put the shim. So what I'll do is 
So I'll use that as a guide to see if that's the size I need. Okay, so the shin's actually a little bit bigger than that. So not a problem. I'll just go in, I'll cut a little bit more off. Just like that. I'll go back in and check it. And we're pretty good. Okay. There we go. So from there, we will take our our shim glue. I'll reposition this so I actually have an area to put the glue on. Wow, protective lock, leeward protective lock, however you want to say it. So I will just spew a teeny bit of glue on there. Not much. It looks like I barely it looks like I didn't even put anything on there, but trust me, if you look at it, if you look at the see the shininess on there, it is on there. And that's a water soluble glue, so it, it's yes. meant it's not like a super glue, which is permanent. So if you make a mistake, you're able to use a little bit of water and, and it comes right off. Yes. Yep, absolutely. So the cool thing is all you gotta do is find your mark, put it on the inside, and as best as you can, put it in that pad cup and make sure that everything lines up as best as you can. It's lined up pretty good. So that would be your partial shim. And from there, you would take your pad and know that little mark. Mm. Again, that's all. That's to find home base. So you're lining up the mark with the pad with them on the mark with the shim. Yep, and the on the and on the pad arm. So you know. So you're basically so. The, the, the biggest thing about when you're doing partial shims and taking stuff off is you're trying to remove as many variables as you possibly can to make sure that everything goes back in the same spot. Because if you were to rotate this pad a little bit, as close and accurate as our pads are with the, with the felt and everything else, it's natural material. It's not quote unquote perfect. So there could be like a, like a very small difference between one side or the other. So. Mm. So if you continually rotate the pad and rotate the pad and don't put it in the same spot, you're going to be fight. You're basically going to be fighting yourself the whole time mm. while you're doing this. So eliminating as many variables as you can is very important. Good tip. So put that back in there. And then you can just put the screw back in. Um, you probably, you may or may not have to iron it again. This looks pretty good. Usually you don't have to. But okay. you might. So if you do, don't freak out. It's it's a thing that can happen. So this the partial shim action might be a couple back and forth. Okay. It happens. Um, but when it's done, it should look more like this guy. So we're gonna fold that in there. So it'll look more so like this guy. So I'll close that guy. And again, I know it's not perfectly perfect to see but there's no excessive light at first glance with the light. And then the other way to, I'll say the, the tail no tails, would be to get your feeler gauge. And this is the half thousands? Yes, this is the, this is the thinnest shim Silver. material that you can get. Gotcha. And um, people, people have asked me many a times, well, can't you use a thicker one? Won't that be a little easier? Mm -hmm. That's a very bad road to go down because yes thousands can be a little easier but the problem is it doesn't give you i'll say the most accurate reading so okay. what what could be feeling like a sealed pad is it hmm. and then all of a sudden you're feeling really good yeah this is cool and then you go to play it you're like oh, this isn't so cool you know and then all of a sudden you like you're ba you almost start going backwards so the the extra the little bit of extra time up front that you use the little silver one will save you time i'll say on the tail end so from here, you just go around, you'll push and you'll go around the whole pad. When it's closed, you'll just pull slightly just to see if it's catching. And you'll go all the way around, you'll hit the back too, just to make sure it's all seating. And when it's, when it's grabbing evenly all the way around, you are done with that one. And then you, then you move on to the next one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, excellent. Leroy, thank you so much for that demonstration. We're going to be back next week with, let me switch cameras here. We're going to be back next week with how to install an open hole 
flute pad. So there's a little bit of a different technique that we use for installing those. We're going to be back yeah. here showing you that. Uh, we are going to be, what is the other thing I wanted to say? Uh, make sure that you take the hashtag and put that in the comments below. That's going to give you a chance to win 15% off our engraving course tuition as well as 25% off, sorry, 15% off the SmackDown, 25% off the engraving tuition. Uh, and Mr. Jaeger, uh, make sure you send me an email to rich at musicmedic.com so I can get you your discount code. You are the winner this week. And we send us a sample of Jaeger. <laughs> if you can. <laughs> If you are the person who invented and sells Jaeger, yes, we uh, Please do. We will accept that. We'll have it at the SAC SmackDown. We probably will. Very good. All right, so that's going to do it for this week. We will be back next week with another flute pad tutorial. Happy Pad-tober, and until next time, happy repairing.